Hey everyone, welcome to the CrossFit Health webinar with our guest, Dr. Alessio Fasano. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to introduce Dr. Fasano. He's a well, uh, world-renowned pediatric gastroenterologist, research scientist, and entrepreneur. He directs the Center for Celiac Research and Treatment at Massachusetts General Hospital for Children. He's also Division Chief of Pediatric Gastroenterology and Nutrition and Director of the Mucosal Immunology and Biology Research Center at the Massachusetts General Hospital for Children. A professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School and professor of nutrition at the Harvard T.H. Chan uh, School of Public Health. Dr. Fasano is author of Gluten Freedom, a book for general readers about celiac disease, uh, gluten-related disorders, and the gluten-free diet. He is also co-author with Susie Flattery of Gut Feelings, if you guys can see that, but the Gut Feelings, the Microbiome, and Our Health, published in March 2021 by MIT Press. So thank you so much, Dr. Fasano, for being here with us today. I'm truly honored to have you on here. Uh, thank thanks. you, Mike, for having me. I really appreciate it. Of course. And before we get started and talk about the, the format of this webinar, so um, it's going to be about an hour. And we'll spend the first 30 minutes uh, with me asking you some questions. And these questions are going to be mostly regarding um, the, the book, the, your latest book, Gut Feelings, which, by the way, is, is on Amazon. Uh, and then we'll spend uh, the, the uh, last 30 minutes taking some questions from the viewers. Uh, before we start, you know, I, I think one thing I learned that I think is really, really cool about this book um, and I think it's just good to, to share with everybody here is that uh, all the, you know, all the proceeds of revenue from this book are actually going to research and you and uh, Susie are not taking any royalties from the book. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. That's super cool. Um, okay, well, let's jump into this if you don't mind. Um, you know, before we get into the book, you know, one of the things I think could be really great for our community to understand is just a little bit about your background. Uh, so, you know, how did you get started in, you know, researching the microbiome? Where, where did this, how did this start? Um, you know, I can make the glamorous, you know, uh, statement that was inspirational because if that's what I want to do and so on and so forth, that nothing is true. <laughs> <laughs> if the plan was totally different and, uh, in a nutshell, you know, I knew from uh, the time that I went to medical school that I wanted to do research. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with my naive approach to life, uh, I thought that I wanted to get in the research that will make impact to save, you know, people. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking about cancer and, you know, looking for an internship at the early um, years in medical school. I came across this gentleman that became my mentor and said, you know, no, if you really want to save lives, you have to deal with gastrointestinal disease and particularly diarrheal diseases. And I said, you've got to be kidding me, right? <laughs> I don't find anything glamorous to, to fix, you know, uh, diarrheal diseases. He said, well, believe it or not, five million kids, that was pretty much at that time, will die this year because of diarrheal diseases. And I said, you, what are you talking about? And he went into you know, discussing about, you know, all this, you know, uh, infective diarrheal diseases, cholera, shigella, salmonella. And long story short, I started this journey by studying, uh, you know, the host, so the GI tract and why we got, you know, in trouble when we're infected. And then I reached the point in which, you know, I told him, I really need to know a little bit now the flip of the coin and by the bacteria. And he said, if you want to do that, the only place in the world that I believe that you're going to really enjoy uh, to learn uh, the basics is Baltimore, a place that's called the Center for Vaccine Development. Hmm. So I plan to go there to develop a uh, vaccine against cholera. Mm -hmm. um, I plan to be there just for three months to learn a little bit you know, about here about the genesis. I end up to be there for two years, including developing a a, a cholera vaccine that was a failure, a tremendous failure, but that's off the point. But in that journey, I really realized that this was this fascinating crosstalk between this microorganism and us. I realized there was not just cholera, but many other microorganisms. The ecosystem was very complex. At that time, we didn't know the complexity of the microbiome. We didn't even, you know, call microbiome. And ever since I've been just 
pretty much captured uh, by this parallel civilization for which I just learned a great deal. That's that's great, and I, I do remember hearing the the story. Um, I've listened to a few podcasts with you on there about the uh, the uh, cholera vaccine and kind of how that went all went down and led to this. So that's it's a, such a great story. It seems to be the way that sometimes these things happen. Um, you know, I think at least myself, when I hear microbiome, my head tends to go straight to the gut and straight to bacteria. But there's way more than just that, right? So, you know, just so for our, our general viewers, uh, can we provide a little bit more, uh, you know, detail or background on what exactly the microbiome is? Yeah, well, unfortunately, we as a human species tend to um, believe that we're at the center of the world and the center of the universe. Mm -hmm. And we are a small part of a much more complex ecosystem. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, we evolved since our you know, appearance on, on the face of the earth two million years ago, together with these microorganisms. Um, so it's very realistic to believe that, you know, we here and there sometimes get, you know, in touch with salmonella or SARS-CoV-2 with COVID or whatever. It's a circle of life, so to speak, in which we are a minuscule part of the story. Um, as a matter of fact, if you want to look at the ecosystem as a macrocosm, I just think about the soil, the air, the water, and we are part of the circle. So, you know, again, uh, microorganisms come to us in the GI tract is the one most studied because it's the most rich ecosystem. But as you said, definitely is not the only one, the skin, the lungs, uh, um, the, the, the um, uh, our ways, uh, and the, 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 the general urinary tract, they all have the own ecosystem. Now we mm -hmm. even believe that you know, the blood has an ecosystem when we thought that we're sterile in there. So everything is immersed on this you know, ecosystem. Um, and <clears throat> Of course, bacteria are the one that we study the most because you know we have understanding of their quote unquote genetic libraries, so we can okay. read best uh, libraries. But of course, the microbiome studies, you know, the bacterium, the virome, the parasitome, and there is a hierarchy of these folks starting from the archaea all the way to the most sophisticated last, you know, reiteration of microorganisms. And they circle all the time. You know, they are in our body, we expel them, they go in the soil, the soil they go in the water, the water they go in the air, and then we'll come back, we drink, and we eat stuff from the soil, and this circle all the time, all the time. So we are simply a passage of this ecosystem. Uh, it's one of the stops that they have. So we, we are not that important in the big scheme of things. That's awesome. That's great. So essentially, um, our microbiome, you know, has a lot to do with the environment that we're in. Is that correct? So, you know, what what are the things that affect our microbiome, whether it's positively or negatively uh, throughout life from essentially, I guess, birth or pre-birth uh, throughout life? So a lot of people, they now perceive the microbiome as an additional organ or system in our body because the metabolic capability in the microbiome and therefore the impact on our health. Of course, you know, we are a stage two of three stages process. Stage number one, acknowledging the existence. We didn't have the means to understand that there was such a thing mm -hmm. until thanks to the Human Genome Project, we got mm -hmm. tools and approaches that allow us to then shift from there to the microbiome understanding that where we were able to look at as you know microbes i.e the microscope you know under you know uh, and look at them was just the tip of the iceberg and much more complex you know situations like galileo's pointing you know his lenses to see the stars or the planets mm -hmm. and now we have you know hub um, you know telescope that is in space it can right. look much more that's the man of the difference that we are right now so um and, and the other thing that is important that that's part of, of the corollary that i was saying this is not just they sit there doing nothing mm -hmm. 
-hmm. There is all this continued crosstalk between us and the microbiome. And, and if everything goes all right, based on the plan of evolution, um, you know, there is a symbiotic relationship. In other words, they have advantage to have us as a host. We provide food, we provide, you know, a niche for them to grow and reproduce and then spread to the next cycle to another part, you know, of this, sure. you know, charcoal of life. And we in exchange got from them a lot of stuff, uh, you know, uh, extra calories from nutrients that we cannot digest with our GI tract. Um, the capability to get vitamins that are not sufficient with our diet, <clears throat> uh, the training of the immune system that turns to be the most important things because that will help us to be defended against, you know, um, uh, infections and other problems. Uh, and then of course, you know, the capability to protect us against the bad guys. Mm -hmm. After all, penicillin is nothing else. It's a substance produced by a bacterium to kill another bacterium. Mm -hmm. so, if everything goes by the plan, uh, this, you know, increase our chance to play our genetic cards in a way that we stay healthy. But if we derail from the plan of evolution as we're done by embracing the Western lifestyle, chance exists that this friendly relationship turns to be belligerent. And that will make us to play our genetic card in a such inappropriate way that we increase the chance to switch from genetic risk position to a, a clinical outcome with the disease there are the ones that we see mostly in the Western Hemisphere. They are now in the, in in the upward, you know, um, trend, including uh, food allergies, autoimmune diseases, neurodegenerative diseases, cancer, and so on and so forth. So, and, and we'll, I think we'll get into some of those here in some future questions. But I know uh, you talked about, you know, originally there were these like three key components um, to um, how did you describe it? There, you know, it's like you had uh, your environment, um, the microbiome. That's and, right. So, and, and with the five, know, right? You, that's you, right. Now, now, at the beginning, we thought there were two. So, in other words, the, the, what dictates if you develop a disease or not were two yeah. fields. Right. Your genetic predisposition. So, you have to be at risk to develop these conditions, and something in the environment that eventually would trigger this Some trigger. situation. That's right. And, and we realized that they are absolutely necessary without which you can develop disease, but not sufficient. There are at least another three elements. And these three last that you know, were discovered, they highly influence each other. The third is the loss of barrier you know, function. So in other words, we have the skin, we have the lung airways, and we have the GI tract that really keep at bay these enemies from the environment. In general, these are large molecules like proteins, what we call non-self antigens that can instigate an immune response because they're seen by en as enemies. Mm -hmm. So when, when this barrier, they don't work well, they, they are leaky, stuff comes in mm -hmm. and the immune system will start to be under you know, attack. And the fourth pillar is the immune system. It becomes hyper belligerent because of that stuff. And then last, of course, is the microbiome, otherwise we'll not talk about all this, that has the capability now epigenetically, that's the term that we use, mm -hmm. to eventually switch genes on and off. Right. And that starts the march from genetic predisposition to clinical outcome. Now, these last three elements, the permeability, immune system, and you know, the microbiome, they highly influence each other. So if you have a leaky gut, you will have an immune system that will be hyper belligerent because bombarded by non self antigen. And if the immune system becomes belligerent, the gut leaks or the airways leak. Okay. And uh, if they do, you have an imbalance in the microbiome, or vice versa. If you have an imbalance in the microbiome, you will have an immune system that doesn't work well and you don't have you, the, the bio function that protects you. But ultimately, you know, it, it is the epigenetic pressure, the microbiome that dictates our destiny. Interesting. So I don't want to get too far into the COVID thing, but is, is, the, is there, if, does that potentially play a role in some of the cases in COVID? Yeah, with uh, the... you know, if, if you look at who, who paid the price for COVID, you know, mm -hmm. were people that eventually 
had most likely an imbalanced microbiome because you know they were obese, they had cardiovascular diseases, uh, they, they were elderly, you know, that there were preconditions. They are all the situations that we know that you have an imbalanced microbiome. And yeah. with that, increases the susceptibility to, to get sick. Now, you know, that phase thankfully is gone. And now we are at the fourth reiteration of mutations of the yeah. virus that is extremely virulent is spreading, but not as severe in terms of morbidity and mortality as the first three duration. Sure. Yeah. Now the concern is not infection per se anymore, but the consequence of the infection, what we call the post-acute, you know, uh, COVID infection uh, or, you know, long COVID, that's what yeah. we used to, to, to call it. And we, we are still not in full understanding where are the, con the, the consequences of this, but you know, definitely there are already reports suggesting that a variety of autoimmune diseases now are in, on a ramping up because of the post-COVID uh, infection, uh, and therefore as a consequence of long COVID. And we have also some understanding what is happening. And it's in line with what we believed before, the viral infection can trigger that process that break tolerance got knows too hot that leads to autoimmunity. Interesting. Well, I want to get into, um, well, I think we should get into to zonulin because I think that's a super important, of all, super important part of all of this. And this is a, zonulin is a, um, it is essentially a biomarker, right, or a protein that modulates intestinal permeability. And you and your team discovered this. Can you, uh, Talk about this discovery process, kind of how this went down to, to <laughs> discover zonulin. And then how does it, you know, when, when I think about it, I think about celiacs and I know it has um, some association with, with other, uh, you know, diseases and autoimmune diseases out there, but how does it affect celiacs? And then how is that different than how it affects maybe non-celiacs, gluten sensitivity uh, people? So again, I can be glamorous as I had a great intuition on that. <laughs> it's not true. This goes back to that color vaccine that was a failure. Uh, the reason why it was a failure, that, because you know I spent a couple of years to really engineer this attenuated color vaccine. Attenuated because the color was alive, mm -hmm. and we want the bacteria to be alive because that will induce a strong immune response, mm -hmm. meaning that that will protect you. But mm -hmm. you want the disarmed color so you don't get sick. At that time, mm -hmm. we thought that it was only this toxin. It was it's called cholera toxin. It's a extremely powerful toxin. Mm -hmm. And I was able to engineer, this was at the beginning where you can manipulate genes. So we're talking about, you know, uh, well, forget it. I mean, <laughs> a long time ago. But, you know, I, I did everything done the sun and the vaccine seemed to be just fine. So it, 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 it was ready for prime time for volunteer testing. And of course, at that time, volunteers were medical students. And for $500, they got three chances to get the placebo. So do nothing and cash $500 to get my vaccine. And I said to them, don't worry about it because that's also not to do something. Or you got the real deal color. You're gonna have your know, 10 pound, 10 the, you know, gallons of, of diarrhea, uh, but we will oh. take care of you. So don't worry about it. But two out of three, you're not gonna Brave. be. Yeah. So, and unfortunately, uh, you know, the vaccine didn't work. <laughs> you know, it was not 10 gallon, it was one or two gallons, but totally unacceptable. Sure. So I got drunk, uh, for <laughs> you know, literally two day, two years of work, uh, flush in the toilet, literally in the toilet. <laughs> and then, you know, back to blackboards that why these people, they have this residual diarrhea. And I discovered this toxin that made the intestinal leak. Mm. And studying the mechanism, I wonder, it's not possible that we have this complex machinery just to be targeted by a toxin from a bug that will kill us. Most likely, color has been smart enough to study the physiology, our GI tract, and mm -hmm. find a way to exploit this pathway for its own use. And in the reason why that, we discovered zone in, in 2000. And, 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 and this still, you know, the only molecule, about actually it's a family of molecules that, you mm -hmm. know, um, are capable to physiologically modulate the spacing between cells that in the past we believed that was cemented, now we know that there are doors, they're called tight junction, most of the time closed. So zonulin is a sort of key. 
It's not just in GI tract, it's present in the lung, in the blood brain barrier, because even the endothelial cells are controlled by zone and so on and so forth. And of course, you know, when the physiology is pushed to the limit, you have pathology, and now many groups worldwide have been linking uh, the excessive production of zonin into a variety of chronic inflammatory diseases, starting with, uh, you know, uh, allergy infections, uh, including COVID-19, by the way, hmm. uh, cancer, autoimmunity, and so on and so forth. And we focus, you know, among all this condition on celiac disease. Why? Because it's a one-of-a-kind autoimmune disease in which is the only one for which we know the trigger. Sure. That is gluten. So we can yeah. play and turn on and off the process of will by taking gluten out of the diet or reintroducing the diet. Mm -hmm. And le that led us to understand that the five pillars that we we're talking about, this increased permeability was due to an excessive production of, of zonulin. Mm -hmm. um, so much so that now that zonulin inhibitor, uh, as an alternative to the gluten free diet, because if any of the five pillars that you take, that, you know, that disease should not be there. Okay. So, of course, you can add the genetics, the immune system, we don't want to use immunosuppressant on a disease like celiac disease. Manipulation of the microbiome is going to be the future, but we don't have quite there yet. Mm -hmm. What is left? Gluten-free diet that we do, or an alternative to stop the zonulin pathway so the gluten doesn't come in the body. And with that proof, um, uh, you know, we're able not only to prove that indeed, you know, gut permeability is an important part of the story, but also, you know, this inhibitor nice phase three trial, and hopefully if it's gonna go well, it's gonna be on the market. Um, wow. And we found the same story with uh, not severe gluten sensitivity, it's the same situation in traffic. So the early steps are the same. So gluten is ingested, is only partially digested. Some of these fragments that we identified can inst instigate zonal release. <clears throat> this fragment uh, after that zone is released will come in and we'll make the immune system to fight. Now, the split is that, you know, on, on celiac disease, it's an autoimmune disease. So there are some elements of the immune system involved. Gluten sensitivity, there are other elements that are involved because it's not an autoimmune disease. Okay. So, okay. Um, gluten is one way that we can get this increase of zonulin in our system. I know you had talked about other ways. Um, and, and, and if I recall correctly, one of the other ways is, is it small intestine bacterial overgrowth? Is that the other way? Is it specifically That's in, the, in the small intestine? That's right. I mean, any dysbiosis, so imbalance okay. in the microbiome, any as I told you, they highly influence each other. So if sure. you have an increase, you know, um, if, if you have a, an imbalance in the microbiome or you have microorganisms that goes and colonize the small intestine that they should not. Okay. Uh, so the small intestine bacterial growth, that will cause a release of zonulin. So those okay. are other stimuli, um, even more powerful actually, gluten in, in, in determining the zonal release. As a matter of fact, a lot of people believe that this increased zonal release as a biomarker of a variety of chronic inflammatory diseases are all linked to dysbiosis. Oh, wow. Um, so you mentioned a few other areas that zonulin is, is found. So you said not only the gut, but where else, where else would you find this? Well, anywhere there are barriers in between body compartment or between our body and the external wall. So it's found, you know, in the GI tract, in the genital tract, in the lungs and airways in general, but also internally. So in the TV cells, are modulating the trafficking of fluids and the molecules from the bloodstream into the you know our components of our body and in those the blood brain barrier of course mm -hmm. that regulate the traffic between the systemic circulation of the brain all this seems to be regulated by different members of this zonal family okay so in, in is is gluten and SIBO specific to zonulin in the gut do we know what would, would increase zonulin uh, production in these other tissues? So that is a good question. <clears throat> we know that it's increasing the production of zonulin in the gut, but also in the bloodstream. So in other words, okay. systemically, you have more zonulin. Where okay. this end up to act, that is you know, a, a big question. And it all depends on what is the genetic background mm -hmm. that the individual is affected and eventually you have different co consequences depending on the, this district, the organ, the tissue that it will be involved. 
Okay. There is an app, for example, you know, <clears throat> there is a group that found that uh, rheumatic disease, you know, um, um, like, you know, uh, ankylosis spondylitis or rheumatoid arthritis, they mm -hmm. have the production of zolin and they are considering this inhibitor for, for the treatment of this condition. Uh, MS, at least in animal models, shows that there is zolin, you know, related to that and, you know, brain cancer. Um, same story. So there, there is a variety of conditions in which this molecule seems to be out of control. Yeah, I mean, you have a, you know, there's a table in chapter six uh, that has a pretty, pretty long list of, yeah. of uh, conditions associated with it. Um, well, it's, it's also <coughs> important to, to know this. This, this are evidence coming from different researchers from all over the world. So that has been the most, you know, rewarding, you know, experience because the validation yeah, when you do sure. a discovery, <clears throat> most of the time it's a dead end, and yeah. you are the one I see it. But when yeah. you start to see other people, <clears throat> they come up with the same results and they're taking different angles. Uh, that that means that you know the story is real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all. That's great. That's yeah. You know, and I had some questions about that. You know, I think in terms of our community, it would be really interesting to understand. Um, you know, a little bit more on how zonulin is involved in conditions like, you know, type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, or, you know, obesity. Um, and I'm sure it's a little bit different for each one of those, but there are probably some, you know, similarities. Oh, yeah. In the <clears throat> yeah, I mean, and again, uh, at the dawn of the discovery, one of the first <clears throat> evidence of zonulin involvement in the pathogenesis of, of, of chronic inflammatory disease was exactly type 1 diabetes. That mm -hmm. was the actually probably the first evidence that we we're able to intercept type 1 diabetes in this animal model by giving the zone inhibitor early in the wow. process. You know, because we know in these animals that um, these are rats, they are pre pre predisposed to develop diabetes. Mm -hmm. They yeah. like humans, they develop this uh, early age and then eventually if you don't give insulin, they die and so on and so forth. But we're able to discover in these animals is that the first thing that happened, they lose bladder function. Mm -hmm. So there is an increase in their gut permeability. Uh, a couple of weeks later, there are the outer antibodies against the islets. Mm -hmm. And then another couple of weeks later, they eventually develop, you know, um, full boom type one diabetes. Um, so based on that, we give this zone inhibitor early enough so soon after that you know they've been winning from their mom and, and that was the time in which with, with the child solid food in, introduced that's when we saw the increase of gut permeability and the one that 80 percent of the ones that were treated with its own inhibitor they did not increase the gut permeability the outer antibodies did not appear and they survived so wow. um that's right so uh, and then there were some uh, um, other evidence in type 2 diabetes, um, you know, uh, that, that is, you know, also seem to suggest that, you know, uh, a, 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 that this, this, this component there. And last but not least, obesity, I believe that is <clears throat> a series of, 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 of evidence that are quite remarkable for a couple, no, three different groups in which they compared, you know, lean people with obese people, with the morbidly obese people with complications like, you know, the fatty liver and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. both in kids and adults. And they show that, you know, the more obese you are, the more um, high level of zone you have in your bloodstream, and the more uh, severe is the insult to your liver, the more zone you have. So clearly, um, now that we know that even you know obesity is an inflammatory disease because there is an inflammatory component, clearly th that triangulation of of you know loss of bladder function, um, you know that leads to these endotoxins to come in, low degree of of, of inflammation, and then from the per portal circulation, this endotoxin from a dysbiotic imbalance microbiome will eventually go to the liver, and mm. then insult will materialize and what, what do you is it, i mean in your in your opinion and in the research um is it diet related like what's the cause there are multiple <coughs> lifestyle 
you know, some genetic components. That's right. right. It, it is multifactorial. Yeah, of course. Uh, definitely, uh, of course, if you eat 5,000 calories you sit on a couch, that, that will do it. But if you have your mom obese, or, and or your father obese, the chance you will be obese is extremely high. So there is definitely a genetic component. But, like, you know, with animal studies and now uh, even, you know, evidence in humans, uh, it is pretty obvious that, you know, receiving the wrong microbiome that is scavenged more calories uh, from your mother that is obese will put you in an obesogenic trage, uh, uh, you know, trajectory um, because, hmm. well, just receiving the, that imbalanced microbiome will do that. And you can, and that, and that receiving that imbalanced microbiome can actually happen through the birth process. Is that correct? Correct. Correct. Interesting question I have just came up from that. So I know there are other issues that can pop up from something like a C-section. But if you, if, if you have an obese mother and you do not have a vaginal birth and you have a C-section, can you potentially bypass? Yeah. So, I mean, I know it can lead to other issues. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a good point, but potentially. Uh, but once again, that will be part of, you know, again, this is such a complex matter. Yeah, of course. Um, definitely, you yeah. will be advantaged by not receiving a obesogenic microbiome. Right. But you also live in, 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 a, in a household in which genetically you have genes that scavenge, um, you know, um, energy for you that, you know, two million years ago was a great advantage when you were, you know, hunter, you know, gutters, because, you know, you may not know if there's food. So you want to have reserves like the camels they do with the water. Now it's a great disadvantage. And the other thing is, you know, <sighs> lifestyle. If you, 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 your parents, they do a, a sedentary lifestyle, if they eat junk and so on and so forth, your chance to develop obesity, even if you go with C-section, it will be you yeah. know higher than the general population. So that's something that also needs to be taken into consideration. Yeah, the environment will still be there, yeah, for sure. Um, we're gonna get some some questions coming in from the uh, viewers soon. I, I did have um, one question uh, similar to what we were just talking about, but it's more specific to uh, SIBO, so small intestine bacterial overgrowth. Um, we know that is a trigger for increased zonulin activity, but when it comes to SIBO, is, is that specifically diet related or what, what are the components that come into that situation? We, the, the, the simple and honest answer is we don't know. Okay. Um, so there are people that the SIBO seems to recur in the same family. So some people believe that there is a genetic component. Some people believe that there is lifestyle that is really a, created the syndicate for that. Well, you know, one thing that we know for sure, the abuse of, of um, acid suppressors in the stomach mm -hmm. is not being linked to the increased risk of SIBO. So imagine the fact that we swallow every day got the zillions of microorganisms, 80, 90% of them would die in the stomach because the pH two would not make these people to survive there. Okay. Um, so the load that comes outside there, it's relatively low. And because of the peristalsis, the, the washout and, and the secretions, they don't get a chance to, you know, uh, colonize. Imagine when you got out of the stomach, it's like a river. In the center, there's a strong current and you just keep going. Mm -hmm. When you move toward the banks, that, you know, that slows a little bit. Mm -hmm. then you may eventually have some people that can get there, but the number is so small that, you know, the chance is very little. But if the pH goes up to four or five most of the time, rather than kill 80% of this, you know, microorganism, you kill 50%. Now the load is huge. That's one possibility. Of course, anything that creates this, you know, this motility of your gut, slow down that, you know, nice squeezing and relax and peristalsis and move stuff along. So mm -hmm. you have something like this and everything stays there increase the chance because now you don't have this strong flow. Mm. You have this stagnant water. And so these folks uh, easily attach there. Attached, and sure. if they do, they are resilient. Why? Because there's a lot of food there. There's no competition. That's an yeah. ideal place to live. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, that makes sense. 
We did get some questions from, from the viewers, so I'm gonna start going through these. Uh, first one, um, yeah, so uh, great question. What are your thoughts on probiotics? Uh, I guess we can throw prebiotics in there too, but what are, your th what are your thoughts on probiotics? Worth it, not worth it, and why are some <laughs> refrigerated and not? That's right. That's a very good question indeed. And, uh, you know, I, again, I, this is a question that's been asked to me all the time. In yeah, time. I bet. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I believe that they hold huge promise, you mm. know, role in manipulating our destiny. The problem is that we really rush into the process without knowing exactly what we're doing. So yeah. in other words, we just start crawling and now we pretend running. We, we got to just learn to walk first. So sure. what, what I'm trying to say is that we are the dawn to understand mechanistically uh, why a certain composition and functional medical biome brings me to a clinical outcome that is not you know, healthy for me. See, if I don't know which component of the microbiome is doing that, I don't know how to manage that, how to manipulate that. Right now, we just give the probiotics, they are mm -hmm. the good guys, hoping that throwing in there mm -hmm. will do something good for me, but I'm, I'm not sure what's going on there. So same for fecal transplants. So it's a shot in the dark. I yeah. truly believe that in the future, if we don't, you know, dissipate the power of the probiotics by using and abusing them now, I believe that they will play a superb yeah. role in helping up reshaping the microbiome in a more symbiotic relationship with us. Same with the prebiotics, prebiotics being the food mm -hmm. for the good guys. You know, um, if you allow me this parallel, imagine you know, the microbiome as a sort of farm Mm -hmm. um, um, in which you have cows, you know, you have chickens, you have uh, uh, rabbits, you have horses, they eat different stuff. Mm -hmm. And you want all of them because that's what the farm will, will be balanced. If you have that all those animals, yeah. all the service of the, the farm will be served. If you uh, eventually do not feed them all because you go on a special diet, you eat junk, uh, you, you don't eat the balanced way that you're supposed to, or you take abuse of antibiotics. Some of these animals would be a disadvantage, either because they don't have food or because you kill them with antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Now, that makes you know the farm to have too many cows, for example, mm -hmm. and not chicken, and therefore you have too much poop to shovel around and you don't have eggs to, mm -hmm. to sell, and that's not good. So that's what the, pro, the, the proposition of the prebiotics to help to rebalance and feed everybody. But once again, no, not now, but in the future, when we understand exactly what kind of dysbiosis brings to what kind of problem, we will have the capability through the huge amount of data that we're generating and machine learning to personalize intervention. In the meantime, when people ask me, and then what I should do now, I would say, go natural. Use natural source of probiotics, you know, yogurts, best yeah. source of probiotics. Why? There are many strains. And by the way, in general, good probiotics, they have to be multi-strains because they help to quiet the ecosystem there. If you use a single strain, it's complicated. What is now a multi-billion dollars industry of the probiotics, yeah. it's, it's a mix of fake news, of people that make <laughs> claims that they are not sustainable <clears throat> because, you know, are not being scientifically proved. Probiotics, by the way, they need to be large number. We're talking about billions of CPUs and then maybe they are not in there. Uh, you know, they, have, they are live animals, so they have half shelf lives sure. that is not forever. Sometimes there are nothing in there, or worst case scenario, there are pathogens in there. So <sighs> why all this? Because the, 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 until now, the entire industry is now regulated because who produce probiotics do not intend to sell them as a medical intervention, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. has a food additive or good for your health, so, so to sure. speak. Therefore, yeah. they elude all the scrutiny of the Food and Drug Administration that way. Yeah, essentially a supplement, right, to some extent. Correct.
And and you know, from from at least my understanding, the ideal microbiome is there isn't one, right? It's very relative to the person. So so you know, <laughs> this is not a good point. Um, you know, the 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 the, the many of my colleagues still are in search of the normal microbiome and they sure. believe that they will reach that search by big numbers. So if they right. sequence a million people, they are healthy, they will find them the, 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 the normal microbiome. The reality of the story, if it's true as it is, that the microbiome needs to be personalized on your genetic background because you have to have this symbiotic relationship. Mm. And because we all, even monozygous and twins are genetically different because epigenetically we, we express in a different way these sure. genes. The corollary of this premise is that all the microbiome cannot be equal from two people. Yeah. yeah. What is equal is the outcome of this interaction. We all have to have the blood pressure within a certain range or the glucose level in a certain range. And that is a, a, a achieved by having this symbiotic relationship that keep us metabolically in the steady state. But how we reach that is very different from one to the other. No, that makes sense. Um, we have a question about a specific uh, condition. So um, with something like IBS, you know, how, how, can, how can you control some of those symptoms like you know, gas or bloating? What, what <clears throat> can be done there? So, um, you know, let me, may, let me share another secret because I believe that's known. Um, IBS stands for irritable bowel syndrome. The word syndrome in the healthcare means I don't know what's going on. That's okay. what it is. Otherwise, it would not be called a syndrome. Right. Meaning that IBS is a mixed bag. As a matter of fact, now that people, they start to really make a little bit of more sense, is that divided in three major categories. IBS diarrhea, IBS constipation, mm. and IBS mix, diarrhea and constipation. The IBS diarrhea has been studied a length and is related, believe it or not, to change in gut motility, to dysbiosis, to increase of, of zonulin. And you know, all this will eventually create the condition to eventually develop the symptoms that are typical of IBS. Where these symptoms they come? Come from a, an imbalanced microbiome that increase now the capability to ferment. And ferment, is a, a metabolic operation that has as a final product gas. And gas causes distension, stomach ache, bloating, and so on and so forth. As a matter of fact, one of the most powerful treatment right now is the FODMAP diet. Mm -hmm. FODMAP is this F say for fermentable uh, uh, oligo uh, 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 saccharides. So in other words, sugars, mm -hmm. they are um, mono oligosaccharides that you eliminate from the diet is a very nasty diet that you have to embrace for a few weeks yeah. so that you subtract, you know, the substrates and microorganisms to generate the gas and therefore the symptoms. And the idea to go on this diet is that you start these animals so that they will eventually would not be there. And by the time that you resume a more regular diet, you will not have the symptoms that you start with. But the reality of the story there right now, the IBS is one of the most frustrating conditions because we do not have an efficient treatment um, that eventually um, a pill or something. Uh, it, it takes a lot of changes in lifestyle, in mm -hmm. diet, um, and, and again, um, rule out SIBO that can create the IBS kind of symptoms. Um, gluten sensitivity is not a condition that can mimic IBS. So from this mixed pot, once in a while we pull up stuff out there and we know what's, what is causing that and that will give us the chance of a therapeutic target in the forest solution. So if we're, if, if this viewer is uh, thinking about something they can start uh, looking into an elimination diet like the FODMAP diet, doing that for a few weeks and then slowly adding those foods back in. I would not um, implement a, a full mass diet by myself. I would you, definitely do this under the supervision of very knowledgeable dietitian. Okay. Not easy to implement, 
no reason to plan in terms of you know um, going back on 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 an unrestricted diet. So this mm. needs to be done, not just mom and pop kind of person sure. who's home uh, by yourself. You got to really do because it's a therapeutic intervention. Yeah, yeah. You, you need no, that makes perfect sense. They judge you with the process. Per that makes perfect sense. Absolutely. Um, here's one. Um, you know, I we think we we you talked about this just a little bit, um, but it'd be interesting to hear more about it. So they're asking about um, in studying the microbiome, is it is it possible to develop a cure for celiac disease? Now, I think what you're what's going through trials right now isn't necessarily, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, because I may not understand it correctly, but it's not necessarily a cure per se, but it's a way to uh, decrease zonulant activity to prevent uh, celiacs from happening, right? Is that, I mean, there's still- right. so, so the bottom line is the following, uh, you know, there the, 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 the are in the pipeline many, many trials on celiac disease. Most of them are to ameliorate the consequences of, um, you know, a, a, a inadvertent cross-contamination or ameliorate symptoms of people that despite they are strictly gluten-free, they still have symptoms. Mm. There are a few that are targeting to quote-unquote cure. So in other words, to reprogram the immune system to tolerate mm. gluten, but we're far from having that, you know, available. Back to the microbiome. You know, we have a, a, a NIH-funded prospective study that's called CDGEM, because, you know, um, that stands for Seal Disease Environment Microbiome Metabolomic Study. Uh, um, the, the, the problem is that if we study 100 people with celiac disease and 100 people, they are healthy, and we look at their microbiome, we will find a different microbiome. We know this is a fact. But what we don't know is, is this difference of the microbiome has been causing celiac disease or is the consequence of an inflamed gut. So therefore it's not the cause but the consequence of celiac disease. Sure. With this study of kids at risk, we know before, during and after the evolution of the microbiome and we interrogate the system, why, what is different in the kids that develop celiac disease versus the one that starting from the same starting line did not develop it. And now we start to see some interesting change in the microbiome that makes a lot of sense to us. Some have been published, some not yet, mm -hmm. in which, long story short, microbes have been in the past as associated to increase the immune system belligerence because the load of, of LPS that they have, uh, or been isolated in other diseases with inflammation, are enriched in the kids that develop, you know, celiac disease. Mm -hmm. Some of the protective component of the microbiome, on the other hand, seems to be reduced in the ones that develop celiac disease, while it's still there in the one that did not. So theoretically, at least we can imagine if we have the chance to swallow kids at risk and we see this shift that happened, by the way, months before that they developed the problem, we may eventually use these strains, treat these folks so that the new system will be programmed to tolerate rather than to um, hmm. you know, fight gluten. And you know, if that's true, these kids will be in a perpetual mode of um, you know, tolerance to gluten. It means that's prevention though, yeah. uh, not cure. Okay, no, that makes sense. How long are you guys following around these kids? Um, how, how, what, what is the... It's a very complicated for study because, yeah. of course, you know, um, and, and celiac disease, again, is an ideal model that if we should do this for Alzheimer, we should follow people for 70 <laughs> years. That would be in one <laughs> right. um, But these kids have been followed for almost 10 years, some of them. Um, wow. and, and we know everything about them. So long story short, the lesson that I learned from this study, and we have a similar study with autism that's called Gemma, mm -hmm. is, is the following. If everything that I'm seeing will pin out to be true and implementable in healthcare, this is gonna be the future. So you come to my office, you bring with you your, your genetic chip, you know, that I put in my computer and you bring also a sample of your stools that I ask you to bring with me, with you. While I visit you, I will have my machine that will do the sequencing of your microbiome that will be done in my office in 20 minutes. 
then I take that sequence, put in the computer with your genetic, you know, um, you know, uh, genome, you know, information, and based on mathematical modeling that, that's been, you know, validated over and over again by deep machine learning with millions of peoples, it would tell me, you know what, Mark, in ten years you have a seventy percent chance to develop serious disease or Alzheimer, and we need to do something about it. And this is the probiotics that you need, or the prebiotic that you need, or the symbiotic that you need, reshaping that interaction so that that risk will be mitigated. That's what I see coming in the future. How long is it going to take? I don't know. That was my next question. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it is so unpredictable. Um, you know, if somebody, you know, three years ago will have told me that what are we right now with this research, I would be, I would say, you must be out of your mind. Somebody three years ago will have told me that I will live in experiences as I did with a, a pandemic, I would say, you're out of your mind. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. And yeah. if somebody three years ago would tell me that we're still making the same mistake and engaging worse, like in Ukraine, I would say, you must be out of your mind. People do not make this kind of mistake once you've done that once or twice. But look at this. Look where we are. Yeah. Here we are. Here we are. Oh, that's interesting. Um, here's another one really quick. Uh, is there any research on zonulin in coronary endothelium? For example, higher levels, increasing permeability and allowing inflammation in and triggering atherosclerosis. I, I'm not aware about atherosclerosis, but I, I, I am aware of many years ago, uh, some studies that on, on what is called dilated cardiomyopathy. So this is a bad, bad condition in which, you know, the, the myofibroblasts that makes, you know, the, the, the muscle, of the heart, they, they, they swallow and nobody knew what was going on. And the endothelium loosened up and there's this influx of fluids, you know, outside the, the, blast, the, the, the vessels and, and this was zone related. Um, the atherosclerosis, it's, 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 a, it's a very complex inflammatory process uh, sure. in which, of course, there are components in which there is inflammation. Now, people believe that so this, this blood microbiome that, you know, favor this atherosclerotic plaques, of course, the diet with, you know, uh, yeah. excess of saturated fat and so on and so forth. And I saw an anecdotal report that Zonin be involved in this as well, but I never seen a... a a, 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 um, a validated, you know, finding by other groups. So I, I, I don't know. You don't know. Okay. Uh, something that's really cool. We have a family here that's a CDGE MM. All right. Yeah. So they said thank well, you for well, all your. Let doing. me. Let me. Then this gives me an opportunity to say something. You know, in general, when you do these studies, you know, families that it's it's a it's a it's a huge commitment for the family mm -hmm. so because you have to provide you know information data your child data your family the first year you have to provide the entire year of you know the dietary you know um you know um uh, uh information how many you know antibiotics in other words it's a commitment but the tremendous success of the cd gem we have a very low drop off rate is due to the fact that families they took ownership of the projects. We are just facilitator, but they, they have their own communities. They have yeah. their own chat room in which we are not allowed. They help each other, um, and, and and again, why? Because they want to see a better future for your, their kids. Remember, in order to participate, a family members must be already affected by severe disease. So these mm. people are heroes in my eyes because. They they give us to, to give at the community a great deal of information that will benefit not only their own family but you know future generation other families and not only people affected by severe disease but many other conditions which you know the five pillars that we discuss are yes. repeating themselves over and over again no matter what kind of disease you're talking about. Oh yeah, I mean that's. It's a great point. And like you said, they're heroes and it's really so who, cool that we have the family. Here. Yeah, it's really great we have them on here. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Um, okay. Is it common or typical for those who are diagnosed with celiac disease to eventually start having issues with many other foods? 
so this particular person, shortly after uh, being diagnosed, uh, they had developed a peanut allergy uh, and then later was not able to tolerate legumes and then had to avoid corn. So can this progress into some type of, I would assume, allergic reaction to other foods? It's not unusual, um, but, but it's not frequent either. Um, the mech, we don't know exactly why, but the mechanism that seems to be at the basic of all this is if when you develop the disease, and actually when you are diagnosed with severe disease, we don't know when this was developed, that was a month before, a year before, 10 years before. Mm. Depending on the degree of the damage of the intestine, you may have consequences coming out of that. So let's say, you know, an adult, an adult with this no typical size, the, the, the small intestine is roughly 18 and 19 feet long. So it's, it's a long, long tube. And if you have one or two feet that are inflamed, the repairing process would take a relatively small period of time. Mm -hmm. But if you have 10 of the 18 feet that are inflamed, it would take much longer. When it's inflamed, everything leaks through. Mm -hmm. And if you have legumes that are not completely digested, so protein, the legumes will come through, or protein, the currents will come through. On a specific genetic background, they are seen as enemies and the immune system will fight. And I that see. will create the condition that you will react with symptoms when you ingest those. When the you know, healing process is completed, the vast majority of people that develop secondary intolerance to other food stuff will be able to tolerate that. How long is it gonna take? It depends on individual. There is no fixed rules because again, it depends on how much you know, the intestine is inflamed. Yeah. How good you've been with the gluten-free diet? How often you have in you know um, inadvertent exposure to gluten and therefore cross contamination that you're not aware? All these are elements that would dictate the speed of repair and therefore the capability to tolerate again, okay. you know, this good stuff. Okay, no, it's great. Uh, really quick, we have another family here. I just wanted to let you know they're on here as well. So. That's all great. right. Yeah. I'm awesome. glad that they, they took the time to be there. Yeah. Um, I will not, I, I will talk about the weather of, this, of the Red Sox if, if I will have <laughs> these awesome families, uh, you know, that are helping us out. That's, a, that's amazing. Um, here's a great question. Assuming that I feel physically great, how can I know if there's an imbalance in my microbiome? You know, again, um, right now we don't have the technology that you can, you know, figure it out. There are some companies out there that, you know, like the, you know, uh, they, they do whole genome sequence for like 23andMe, and now there are the counterparts for the microbiome that seems to, you know, have the tools to uh, sequence all your microbiome and tell you is good or not. Now, we are, you know, at the point in which we do this in the lab all the time, but economically speaking, now we are at the point in which that is affordable also for, yeah. for you know, clinical care, if you wish. So sequencing the microbiome is not an issue anymore. Interpreting it, mm. it remains an issue because as I told you, we're not quite there yet. Sure. Uh, so um, this is a long way to answer the question. Even if somebody will sequence your microbiome, if not put in the context who you are genetically, where you live, your lifestyle, it's hard to say it's a normal microbiome or not because it's so personalized. Um, so that's that, that's long and short. We will at some point, you know, I give you the example. My vision was going to happen in the future, yeah. but no, we're not quite there yet. So mm -hmm. and just to finish, common sense is, you know, if you feel well, meaning that you're doing stuff well meaning that you're doing a good, you're living a good lifestyle. You eat healthy, you have a good sleep, you know, IG, you are not stressed too much, you exercise. They, they are the common sense thing that you need to, to do to live well. I mean, I think that's, I think that's a, a, uh, a great point probably to stop here with, given we have like three minutes left, right? So you know, we, we went through all this and um, right now, you know, one of the best protections it seems like in order to maintain a healthy, a healthy microbiome 
nutrition, so eating well. Uh, I'm assuming, you know, it, it's it's really staying away from processed foods, overly processed foods, trying to eat uh, natural whole foods uh, and as much as you can uh, from those. Um, exercising well, sleeping well, managing stress would be a great line of defense uh, against a disrupted microbiome. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, I can't stress enough about the diet. You, you probably, you know, are aware about, you know, the Mediterranean diet. Now it is revamping its popularity, why sure. these people, they live longer life and so on and so forth. And, and you know, it's the closest that we have, the way that we evolved. Mm -hmm. Where we are gathering hunters, we eat a lot of fruits, a lot of vegetables, a lot of fruits, nuts, tubers. Why? They were there. You just pick it. Sure. Meat, of course, but rarely. You got to catch an animal, not every day, maybe sure. every week, every 10 days, maybe once a month. And lean meat, because these animals are fighting to escape predators, including humans. Mm -hmm. So, not, you know, beef it up with hormones or antibiotics sure. and so on. Yeah. But the person that put the, the Mediterranean diet on the radar screen did that coming where I was born and looking ultra centenarian there. I said, mm. how come, what are you doing? He focused on the diet, but these are people that walk everywhere. Mm -hmm. They're people that have low level of stress because mm -hmm. they live an easy life. Mm -hmm. They have a great climate. They, 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 they enjoy, they grow together. They don't, you know, do anything, you know, that's out of the ordinary. And that's, they, they, they age together. And by the way, aging, it's another process of inflammation where, yep. you know, there, there are beautiful papers out there that if you, ultracentenarians, they have very low level of zone and they have a mm -hmm. very different microbiota that people, they die very early for cardiovascular diseases, for example. That's and, so and you know, Drosophila, the fruit fly. Yeah. You know, lifespan is not dictated by the, the, the chronological age of the Drosophila, but when herbs, you know, their they gut start to leak. And there are specific genes that they start this process. And if you mutate the gene, you double the life expectancy of the fruit fly. Wow. All this to say back this triangulation between inflammation, you know, gut permeability and, and you know, uh, microbiota. So that's the reason why not just a diet by a lifestyle, the Mediterranean sure. lifestyle that we just discussed. The last point that I miss, and we can close there, good red wine from Italy. <laughs> then we do it. Ah, man, I'll tell you, I mean, from an Italian family, I, I love, I love uh, visiting Italy. I mean, it is a different lifestyle. It's absolutely amazing. I can't wait to go back. But um, no, I mean, this was awesome. I, I, I'm really happy that you didn't go and study cancer and you actually ended up studying this, uh, getting into the microbiome and, and being a pioneer in the field. And I'm really excited about, you know, what you see in the future of this research. And uh, I just want to thank you for being on here with us. We're truly honored to have you on here. And uh, this has been great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark, for having me. I really enjoyed the chat. Of course. Of course. Uh, hopefully you will get a chance to talk again soon. Thank you, Dr. Bye.